Bibles this morning and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. Today I'd like to talk about a generous spirit. A generous spirit. A generous spirit has nothing to do with how much money we have, but rather how much of us the Lord has. That's what we're going to talk about today even though we're going to be talking a little bit about money, because that's the first thing that comes to mind, is of money when it comes to generosity. But it's not everything, is it? Uh, did you ever hear someone say, you're throwing your money away, out the window. You're throwing your money out the window. That's a kind of a little saying we have in, here in Canada. And it, it means that somebody is spending, spending their money recklessly and wastefully. That's what, when someone says it, that's what they're referring to. And uh, for an example, quit throwing your money out the window on rent. Just move back in with your parents. <laughs> <laughs> that's an inside joke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there are some other things you may hear in other countries. Uh, they may say to you in Sweden, Okay, let me say this to you. You bought a pig and a poke. <laughs> you know what that means? All right, when they say that, some of you might. Uh, a poke in old times was a bag. And in, I guess in Sweden, back in the old days, they would sell baby pigs in a bag. Oh. Okay, so it meant that you were buying something without truly looking into what you bought. You just got, you bought recklessly. Because I guess... Uh, Sometimes people would, instead of putting a pig in the bag, they'd put a cat. Oh. <laughs> so uh, that's how they rip people off. So, yet, so if, someone said, someone, if someone said to you, you bought a pig and a poke, they meant you bought something without really checking it out. If you're in Italy, you may have heard someone say, you have deep pockets, but short arms. <laughs> now it's a way of saying you're just cheap. Yeah. All right, you're just tight-fisted, all right? Uh, that was not a good thing. If you were in Netherlands, in the Netherlands, the Dutch, they would have a saying, they may say you, something like this to you, you bought something for an apple and an egg. Apple and an egg, meaning <coughs> that you got something at a good price. You got, you've got a bargain, all right? You got something for a good price. If you're in Germany, they may say something like this to you. You live like a maggot in bacon. <laughs> that means that uh, you live very luxuriously. All right? you are, you're very wealthy. And then in Spain, you may hear something like this. You have more wool than lamb. More wool than lamb. Meaning that uh, you have a lot of money. Okay, you have a lot of money. So those are little sayings that other countries that uh, have these sayings about money that we do. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever heard of the forgotten be beatitude? The forgotten beatitude. Uh, I think you're familiar with the beatitudes in the, uh, the book of Matthew, right? Matthew chapter 5, chapters 5 to 7, where the beatitudes of our Lord, blessed are the meek. All right, those are the Beatitudes, but there's one Beatitude that Matt, Matthew didn't mention, but rather Paul did on his way to Israel. He stopped by uh, a little place, and he gathered the pastors of Ephesus, Ephesus together. They met them at a seaport, and he reminded them of a Beatitude the Lord gave, but it was not in the Gospels. And the Beatitude is this. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. The forgotten beatitude. And that's and uh, he told that to preachers. <laughs> and so I guess we need to hear that as pastors. And that's all of us, don't we? Yeah. And that's kind of what we're talking about today as a generous spirit. Having that, that ability 
uh, to realize that, you know, the blessings come not when we receive, but when we give, mm -hmm. when we give to others. And that's what we want to look at here today. And uh, uh, that came naturally, that giving, that generous spirit came naturally for some churches in Greece. And that's what we're going to look at here this morning. And I have four characteristics of a generous person. So let's look at this here. Let's, chapter 8, let's look at verse 1. The first beatitude, the first characteristic is being sensitive to the needs of others. Being sensitive to the needs of others. Look at here in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. You know, these churches in Macedonia, who are they? Well, they were the churches most likely mentioned in the book of Acts, chapters 16 and 17. We won't go there, but the, Paul, on a second missionary journey, traveled through Greece and he had, uh, so, you know, he founded some churches in many places, but three of them was in Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, in the region called Macedonia. And those churches uh, were very generous to Paul. And they gave to Paul. We know from his letter to the Philippians that soon after Paul began their church and left, these churches began to support him financially so he could continue ministering and preaching the gospel uh, on his way. And they supported him financially very early in their, in their life as a church. Also, we see here that in this passage, he says that these dear people gave towards a special offering for the suffering Christians back in Israel. All right? During this time in history, uh, Israel was going through a difficult time. There was a drought, and people were suffering. And, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And it's also the other way. The drought comes on the just and the unjust. And so they were suffering with everybody else. They were also suffering persecution because of their faith in Christ. And they needed help. These churches, Paul says, gave an offering to help these dear people back in Israel. Now, why was that so amazing to the Apostle Paul? Why does he mention that? Because he didn't mention the other churches. Well, the reason being found in verse 2. These people were facing persecution. Notice it says there how that in a great trial of affliction, all right, while they were suffering, most likely suffering because of their faith, because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And because they had turned away, some of these people were Jews, and they had turned away from Judaism, therefore they were, being, they were suffering because they were no longer following their old way, and so therefore being denied maybe, losing their job, denied, being lost relationships with family, they were suffering. Also, Gentiles were saved. And because of their faith in Christ and their dedication, they turned away from their idols. And they left them behind. But at the same time, maybe lost their job because of their newfound faith in Christ. And so these people were struggling. They were suffering. Yet, what does he say there? That in this time of trial of affliction... The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded, meaning this, they gave. You know, they could have easily said, we can't give. We're suffering. We're going through trial. We don't have enough. And they said, no, we're going to give. So they had, a, they had a sensitivity to those suffering in Israel. They knew how it felt to suffer. And because they knew how it felt to suffer, they says, I want to help them. I want to be a blessing to those people. You see, we call what do we call that today? 
empathy. All right, that's empathy. What is empathy? Empathy is the ability to understand how someone feels at a moment of crisis in their life. You ever been there? Yeah. All right, we all have empathy because we all suffered in some way. You know how it feels to go through a difficult time. And then when you see someone else going through that difficult time, you say, I know how you feel. I know what you're going through. I know what you need. And because of that empathy, we reach out. And we're generous. Because we, we've been there ourselves. These believers were suffering for their faith in Christ. And so they knew and they understood what the offering was for. That leads us to the second point here this morning. Not only do we see... Uh, are sensitive to the needs of others, but also seeing <coughs> needs as opportunities. Seeing needs as opportunities. Notice it says in verse 3, let's continue on here. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So what's he saying there? Well, let's break it down a little bit, these two verses. The first saying, he no, you notice that he says in verse 3, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power. Now what does that mean? You know, we can do a lot of things in our own strength. Right? Well, I mean, we can give. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Even unsaved people have empathy. So when we show empathy, are we really showing a great Christian, you know, characteristics? Well, in some ways, but it's also the unsaved. They show empathy. They have charities. And they give. And they help. So, you know, let's, you know, let's, let's kind of look at it. Naturally, yeah, anybody can have empathy. Anybody can show, be generous. Even the unsaved can do that. So what is he talking about the, here that made these people just extra? I mean, it just took them over the top where people could see their faith in Christ. The power of God. Well, he says here, not only was it in their strength, but when they gave... They gave out of a strength that was beyond their power. Where did that come from? Where did that strength, where did that power come from? It, uh, because the way they give, when they gave when they didn't have it, where does that come from? That comes from God. Mm -hmm. You see, that's what Paul's saying here. It says, just wasn't a natural empathy. It just wasn't a natural generosity that anybody can have. These people didn't have it to give. They, you know, they were suffering themselves. They were going without. So what gave them the ability? What gave them the strength to give? It was God. <laughs> it was God's power in their life. And uh, what do we see that? Well, we see what is the power of God here? Uh, we notice that. The word power means a force beyond our human ability, sometimes miraculous. Is God still doing miracles today? Amen. You better believe it. You better believe it. When he can get people to give and to show a, a generous spirit, and we're not just talking about money. Maybe it's your ability to show long-suffering someone that really doesn't deserve it. <laughs> and you're patient with them. But they need that. And you're able to go over and beyond your own natural ability and patience and even beyond what anybody may think is natural or is right. And you show extra patience. You show extra long suffering to that person. That's God. That's God's power. And that's a miracle. And that's through Jesus Christ. 
And that's what he's talking about there. That, that power that only God can give us to be a generous in any way that he wants us to be. So they gave more than anybody thought was possible. Notice it says in verse 3, Paul says in verse 4, when we, when we heard they wanted to give, Paul says we said they didn't have to. We don't expect you to give. You're suffering. But they said, please, meaning they entreated. They begged them, please take our money. <laughs> but you don't hear that very often, do you? <laughs> but that's what they said. We want to give because God was the power behind it in order him to do that. And that, and you know, again, not only does God give us the power to give, maybe when we really can't, but also God opens our eyes to the opportunities around us. Because not everybody sees everything the same way, do they? Not everybody, you know, there's been times when Someone's gave, and I thought, well, I really don't think that's a good cause. And there's been vice versa. Where I gave, and someone didn't really think it was a good cause. But what is that? That's the Lord. That's the Lord, you know, supplying the needs. And, you know, if we don't see the need, somebody else will. Why? Because God will open their eyes. God will, you know, if it's a true need, and he sees that as a need, God will get somebody. Now that doesn't get us off the hook. If God opens our eyes to the need and we see it, then we have a responsibility to fulfill that need if we can. Because God knows, right? We, can, we can't fool God. God knows our heart. So if God's opened our eyes and we're seeing it, just because we say we don't see it doesn't mean God doesn't know. You have to, and so God opens those doors of opportunity for us to be generous to those around us. And you know, some people see the need, but they don't want to be a, you know, they don't want to be a part of that. Why? Well, it reminds me of the lady who had a, a pet bird. And it was wintertime, and she wanted, you know, she's kind of thinking the bird's getting a little cold. It was getting older. And so she went to Dollar Tree and bought a little sweater for a bird. When she put it on the bird, she asked the bird, how do you like your new sweater? All they could say was, cheap, cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about opportunities, I caught my wife going outdoors, going outside with her purse open. I asked her, why are you doing that? She said, because I expect some change in the weather. <laughs> Picking on my wife here this morning a little bit. She's very generous. <laughs> Point number three. The next characteristic of being generous is being first surrendered to God. First surrendered to God. Notice it says in verse five, and this they did, not as we hoped, <coughs> but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. You see, their generosity began before they gave any money. Are you generous when you give money? Does that make you a generous person? No. I mean, that's just the... The, the outcome, that's just the, the evidence that you're generous. The generosity begins for us as believers long before we actually give something because something happens in our hearts, doesn't it? Yeah. Because that's where it has to begin. A generous person for us of faith begins when we first give ourselves to the Lord. That's what Paul says here in verse, uh, verse 5. Uh, he talks about these dear people in Macedonia that they gave, and it says, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. 
They, gave, they dedicated themselves to Christ. They said, you know what? We're going to serve God. And God's going to be first in our life. Jesus Christ is the one who is, uh, we're going to dedicate ourselves to serve him. So they first gave themselves to the Lord. And folks, that's something no one can force you to do. No one can force you to dedicate yourself to the Lord. That's a decision you have to make in your own heart. And does, you say, well, preacher, doesn't every Christian do that? No. Sadly, they don't. And that's something you have to decide. And you have to ask yourself, if, have I dedicated myself to him? That's one of the, the steps we have to take after we're saved, isn't it? Even salvation itself is a decision to choose Christ and to receive him as our personal Savior. And our example, what is our example to be generous? To make that decision that I'm going to give myself to the Lord and be obedient to Him. Well, our example is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Amen. We follow His example when we do that. Notice it says in verse 9. It says this, for we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean here? We know the Lord Jesus Christ knows how to give. Amen. He knows how to be generous. That's what he's saying there. In that verse, that word grace references salvation. We know his grace. How do we know that? Well, notice it says here. That though he was rich, all right, he was in heaven. Jesus Christ, the eternal God, the second person of the Godhead, he always was, always is, and always will be. And so he was in heaven with all the splendor and the glory of heaven as God sitting on his throne. What did he do? Well, it says here, Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Meaning this, God, Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, left all the splendor of heaven to come down to this earth in the form of a man and, and live as a man and live, you know, with... Basically, nothing other than his clothes that he had. And he used his life to minister to others, to die on the cross, that we might have salvation. And one day, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, because we know him as Savior, we're going to be in heaven. And we are going to be wealthy, Amen. far beyond anything this world has ever seen. And did we deserve it? No. Do we expect it? We can't. Why? Because we don't deserve it. We're sinners, but praise the Lord, we're saved by grace mm -hmm. through faith in Jesus Christ. That's our, that, to be a true, generous Christian, that has to be our motivation. When we understand what our Savior did for us and how he became poor. So when we understand that and we see that, then we can say, okay, I can give. I can be generous. That's the secret. And that's the first being first surrendered to God for, for that. And that makes us generous. What's the definition of generosity? What does it really mean to be generous? Well, the definition means ready to help those in need, treating others with honor, liberal in giving. Now, notice in verse 6 and 7, Paul uses the word grace. He's used it a few times in this passage. In, chapter, in verse 9, the grace was in reference to our salvation. God gave. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believing in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the grace of salvation. But notice in verse 6 and 7, insomuch that we desire Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. What's that grace referring to? It's referring to that offering for those dear people in Israel. And people were giving out of their ability to give. And that was the grace. And it's interesting that as they were giving out of generosity, as they were giving with what, you know, giving what they had and making themselves poor, that's what it means, right? <laughs> when we give, we're going to be a little bit poor in one way, financially, but yet, what are they following? They're following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the connection. That's why Paul says he referred to that offering as grace. It was grace giving. It was willing to become poor that someone else might be <coughs> wealthy or well off or better off. Just like us in salvation. And that's why he used that word grace to describe that. And our salvation should motivate us to being generous and giving. Whatever it is, whether it's our time, whether it's our talents, or our treasure, or our ability to help others, we give because of what God did for us, what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross in our salvation. And that leads us to number four, the final characteristics. Being motivated by truth not emotion. Okay? Be motivated by truth, not emotion. Sometimes, and we have, I'm, I'm speaking as a pastor, sometimes we try to get emotion to get people to give. Right? And you've seen that. And uh, now I'm not, a, you know, emotion is part of our who we are. We're emotional people. And emotion can really, uh, you know, do a lot to help us see the need. But Paul's not using emotion here. All right? He's, he's using truth. And you know, that's the best way to give, isn't it? Yeah. That's the best way to be generous. Because, you know, uh, sometimes if, you, if you've been emotionally pulled, you know, to give, when the emotion's gone, you may regret that gift. Yes. Has that ever happened to you? Where you gave out of emotion, and then when the emotion went away... You kind of thought, well, you know, maybe I made a bad decision. Yeah. But when you're motivated by truth, truth doesn't change. Mm -hmm. It stays the same. Amen. It's not like emotions. Emotions change. And so Paul's going from this whole idea of generosity towards these dear people in Corinth because they, uh, when it came to this gift, all right, they did something. And we notice here, in verse 10. Notice it says here, and herein I give my advice. Here's Paul speaking, saying, this is my advice. This is the truth. This is the reason why you should give. You see, when, we, when you read 1 Corinthians, Paul said that they had said they would give. The church in Corinth said, they would give towards his offering. Well, a year has passed and no offering has been taken yet. Yeah. Nothing has been collected. Not only that, but Paul has sent Titus with this letter to tell... And so he's giving some advice to these people about their willingness to give. They said they were going to give. And now this is what he says, to motivate them... And the first thing he uses, to re first reason to give was to keep your word. You said you were going to give, you need to give. Notice what it says in verse 10. And here I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, or this is best. This is the best. You have begun before, not only to do but also to be forward a year. So they had promised to give, but they hadn't taken it up yet. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. He says, you need, to, you need to take up the offering. You need to perform. 
that as there is readiness to will, so there may be performance also out of that which ye have. You, so you need to keep your word. What do we call that sometimes? A vow. The Bible is very clear about vows, isn't it? We got to be very careful. Yeah. When we promise something to God, we need to do it. That's why you got to be careful. That's why when it comes to vowing or promising, we, Paul is not appealing to their emotions. He's appearing, appealing to the truth. And that's why we have to be careful. When we make promises, when we make vows, let's make sure it's according to truth, not emotion. And so he's saying, you said you would do it. You need to keep your word. And then what's another one? Well, turn with me to chapter 9 and verse 7. Chapter 9 and verse 7. He says this, Every man according as he purposed in his heart. So as he has purposed, as he has decided to do, uh, it says here, uh, verse 7, So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. What's the second reason? God will supply your needs. Amen. That's not a feeling. That's a belief. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? <laughs> Do you really believe God will take care of you? And supply all your needs. If you really believe that and, and have faith in that, then Paul says you can give because you because he will. You say, well, I I gave that money and I'm lacking. Well, God will supply. God will supply when we when we give according to that need that He provides uh, that He shows us. And do we have do do we have examples? In the Bible, of God providing for His people, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I, I don't think we're stepping out on a, on a limb here. I think we're there. I think you know this belief that we have in God is actually based on Scripture. It's actually based on the Word of God, and we have examples of this. And one exa and Paul mentions an example. In this, in this, in this passage, go, notice in chapter uh, eight again, and go to verse fifteen. Notice what he says here. Uh, when he says, "As it is written," usually when Paul writes, "As it is written," he's referring to the Old Testament. So something happened. As it is written, he that gathereth much hath nothing over. And he that hath gathered little had no lack. Now, what's he talking about there? All right? Do you know what he's talking about? You got little margins in your Bible with references? Maybe your Bible has a little letter beside that passage, that little phrase. And, it's got a, and you might see another a, 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 a reference in your Bible. I do in my Bible. They're referencing that passage what he wrote. And you can and turn with me to Exodus, and it says Exodus chapter 16, verse 18. Turn with me there. Keep that place there in Corinthians, and let's find out what he's referencing when he, when he wrote that, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Exodus, go to the book of Exodus chapter 16, and actually we're going to begin reading in verse 11. And probably by now you know what he's referencing, right? He's referencing the giving of the manna to the people in the wilderness. And this is what the Bible says. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying, At evening ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at evening the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew had that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness 
there, was, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost, on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, and only for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tent. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some less. So some took more, some were, you know, well, I'm going to take a lot. Some says, well, I really don't need that much. And when they had did meet it with an omer, he that gathereth much had nothing over, he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. What's that mean? It means God supplied exactly <coughs> what they needed. No matter how much they gathered, he said, well, you didn't, you know, if the husband came in, and the wife would say, you didn't get enough. We've got mouths, of, we've got four mouths to feed here. That's not enough. My husband says, that, that's enough. I'm not going back out. And when she made it, it was enough. Another man comes in. The wife says, you got too much. Well, then read all that. When she made it, it was just enough. Amen. That's a miracle. Amen. And folks, that was for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Every day, except for Saturday. The Sabbath. Then they got enough for two days on Friday. But God supplied. Now, God will do that for Israel. Will he not do it for you? Amen. Mm -hmm. You are his children. He is your father. He'll take care of you. He's promised to. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. God's promised to take care of all our needs. We can trust that. That's based on truth. Truth of the word of God. Not emotion. Not emotion. It's the truth of God's word. Our generosity must be based on God's promise to supply all our needs. If not, then... We won't be that generous person. We can't be. Because we're not basing it on the facts of the Word of God. In conclusion this morning, in light of all that the Lord has so richly provided and promised, gratitude, a generous spirit, should be our first response. There was a man, Larry Clark. He was down in Texas. And he was out shopping for Christmas, around Christmas time. And he was using his credit card, buying gifts. And because the way he was buying the gifts, the bank got suspicious and canceled his card. Trying to protect him. But he didn't know it. So he went into the Chicken Express. I guess that's a chicken place in Texas. That he was going to buy some dinner and go home. And when, he, when they you know, got it ready to pay, he tried to use his credit card and it didn't go. You ever had that happen to you? The credit card or the debit card didn't work. And so he was stuck. What's he going to do? He didn't have any cash? Well, a young man in the back of the car <coughs> heard that and had empathy towards him and came out to the front with his debit card and paid for his meal. A show of generosity. Well, Mr. Cook, he wanted to not so much repay the man for his generosity, but show thankfulness for what he had done. Because it helped him out in a time of need. And so he gathered some people together at that same place, the, the Chicken Express, even got that young man's parents and gave him a $50 gift card. And a reporter was hearing about this, and the reporter was there, and she asked uh, the reporter, Asked Mr. Clark, why did you do something like this? I mean, you're giving more back than he did for you. <laughs> and Mr. Clark said that 
He just wanted to tell him, don't stop being a good guy. Yeah. Don't stop being. It is appreciated. You know what? Sometimes in our Christian life, we receive a lot of good things from the Lord, don't we? Amen. Praise the Lord for all the blessings. You know, I know we do have some problems, and we are facing, we're facing some issues here in the church, that, as we heard this morning. But really, let's also remember, God is good. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we have received so many blessings at the hand of God. Even when we're going through the hard times, let's remember the good things that God's done. And we're encouraged to do that. Um, I'm just going to read a passage. You don't have to turn there. You can if you like. But Psalms chapter 65. Uh, notice the, the psalmist said this about the Lord. Psalm 65. And I'm just going to read a few verses here in verse 9. He says this about God. Thou visitest the earth and watereth it. Thou greatly enrichest with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn, but thou hast also provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settest the pharaohs thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the spring, springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy paths drop down fatness. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. It's interesting, the word visitest in verse 9 means that God is bringing blessing. Mm -hmm. God has visited. God has brought blessing to the earth. And one of the greatest ways God has brought blessing to the earth is through rain. The rain. You know, we live in an agricultural community here, southern Ontario. Uh, agriculture all around us. Boy, farmers rely on the rain. And so we rely on the farmers. <laughs> and we, so God is good. He provides the rain that provides us the food and our needs. Let's remember that. Amen. And let's be thankful. And so we can talk about the literal rain that we're thankful for. But as a church, let's remember the blessings. Sometimes the Bible refers to as rain from heaven. The showers of heaven, the showers of blessings that come in our life because God visits us. He comes down spiritually and gives us the blessings in our life. Let's be a thankful people. Amen. And that's also a part of a generous spirit. When we can be thankful for what God has done for us. Our cup should be running over with joy for what God has done for us. Yeah. Because we don't deserve it. Amen. And he is so good to us. Let's bow our heads in prayer.